Uh, this panel is going to take a little bit different tack. It's styled Economic Impact and Innovations, but uh, as you can tell, we have uh, a lot of legislators up here, and, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. But uh, And then we have Ben Shepard. <laughs> Where are you, Ben? Down on the end. Okay, he's back in cleanup, okay? When we misstate uh, things, uh, then Ben is going to step in and correct uh, the record for you. Um, it's, a, it's my distinct honor and privilege to welcome a whole lot of my colleagues. This is this is really uh, uh, inspiring, not only to this representative but to everybody in this audience. That uh, these guys uh, take time out of their 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 lives, their businesses, their careers. Uh, to come spend time out here in West Texas, I'm extremely flattered by that, as you should be too. Um, and I want to publicly thank each and every one of them for taking the time. John Zarwak literally just arrived five minutes ago, and uh, he's going to bless his heart and get, after we're through here, he's going to go right back out the airport and get on the plane and go back to Houston. So um, it's that type of commitment to their jobs. and. Uh, they don't get paid anything to be state representatives. They do it because they care about their districts. They care about Texas, and uh, and I and I want to congratulate and salute each one of them for the service to our state. But what we're going to do, we're going to kind of start off to my uh, left here. Uh, Representative Perry's going to start. I'll I'll let each one kind of introduce themselves, tell a little bit about themselves and their district, and then uh, talk about what's interesting to them. Uh, they're, you know, we say that when the legislature is in session, we can do almost any harm to you we want. Well, during the interim, we're planning on harm that we want to do to you. Uh, and, and we are trying to either unwind or fix things that we did to you last time. So this is a good opportunity for, for them to share with you what they're working on today and uh, issues that they're studying and getting ready for the 84 session, which begins in January of 2015. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll welcome Charles Perry, Representative Charles Perry. Thanks, Drew, and uh, it's, I think uh, I appreciate you for having this event. I've been privileged to be able to be here a while, but it's important that we get reps from around the state out to West Texas, and they need to have a perspective of just how wide the stars are and wide open the space is. and. Uh, how healthcare looks and how schools function. So it's really good to have that perspective and you only get it by being here. No different than it was good for me to go to the Valley. You know, they have a summer event stuff. Uh, I'm Charles Perry from Lubbock, Texas. I serve seven county area out of District 83 currently. Uh, presently could go into my third session. Uh, there may be something different out there. We'll find out in about a month, maybe. Uh, but uh, I've kind of been focusing over some of the things over the interim. I've kind of been carried through the other sessions as we have some safety net programs and some Medicaid and some indigenous health care. And this guy here is probably a bigger expert than I'll ever be in it, but I rely on some of his uh, directives. But we have a state that has a, a welfare state scenario. It's kind of indicative of what's going on at the border on some level, causing some friction and frustration down there. But uh, I think that we have to begin to look at how we administer those, those programs and that those programs um, are actually kind of tied to the federal government in many ways. But that's an issue that's been passionate of mine because I think we need to bend the curve and put us back to a work state mentality instead of a welfare state mentality, not only in a state but as a country, and do it responsibly because it is the number one budget item growing in our budget probably at an exponential way. So I see that as the, one of the bigger issues that we need to talk about today so that 20 years from now we're not looking up and surprised that it has become the number one budget item. So that's kind of where I put some of my time. Uh, CPA and Lubbock, so I got the number stuff. It, it's kind of a sad thing, but that's what I do. But I'm going to turn it over here to Dr. Zerwas, and I appreciate all the guys on this service uh, uh, on this panel. Thanks, Charles. And uh, uh, I want to thank Drew for offering up the invitation to come out here. It's really a privilege. Uh, Drew has uh, came in the same class that I did in 2007. Uh, we uh, we have become fast friends, and his wife Clarissa and and, uh, and, and my wife uh, became just tremendous friends very early on. Uh, Drew is Drew somebody who uh, I have turned to on several occasions to get counsel, 
uh, but he's also a guy who really demonstrates great courage, uh, great insight into issues. Uh, Y'all that live out here are very well served uh, by his representation, and so uh, I know he's going to continue to make a great impact on the on the state of Texas and, and his representation of your interests there. Um, I live a lot in the healthcare world, uh, which is probably not too surprising, and I've been fortunate that Speaker Craddock and subsequently Speaker Strauss have kind of sliced me into an area to be involved in healthcare issues, both on the financing side of it, um, which is, I think, what Representative Perry was talking about, and that is, you know, we've got to rein in the costs of our, our entitlement programs, and we've got to change sort of some of the behaviors that come with entitlement programs if we're going to ever get our arms around them. The number I like to share with people from a budgetary point of view, and to my left, Chairman Otto will knows this because he and I have worked on these two big slices of the budget together. Uh, the budget for health and human this past two, two years that we're in now equals <coughs> education. It has always been less than education, but in terms of total funding, of which yes, a lot of it is federal money, uh, it's $73 billion. And there's not, education is not a much higher than that in terms of what we spend. That is a very, very concerning uh, statistic in my opinion. It has been inching up in, in, in that regard. Uh, Senator Williams, who's here, knows that. Uh, he's seen it kind of inch its way up there. I fear that it could go over the top this next time because we're seeing a lot more people come into the Medicaid program as a consequence of Obamacare and some of the things that have occurred as a result of that. Um, and we're going to be challenged in terms of really reining in that cost. And Representative Perry is exactly right. We have to fundamentally change the way that we are delivering the care in these programs if we're going to ever see us be able to rein <coughs> in that care the cost of that care and a big part of that is really redefining the programs and getting away from a, a, an entitlement mentality and moving towards a mentality of responsibility and there are opportunities for us to do that. One of the things that, that, um, that uh, Drew wanted me to speak to was uh, just some of the things going on with the border especially related to health care issues. Uh, there, there's no doubt there has been a lot in the press about what's going on with health care with people coming across the border in ever increasing numbers. When the children started showing up unaccompanied, then we started to see a lot of concern about what kind of health care issues are they going to be bringing uh, you know, to the state and, and perhaps putting the state at risk. They really come primarily with hygiene problems. That's not really a, a, you know, a, you know, a surprise. They come on, across Mexico. Uh, they make a, an incredible journey across Mexico, across the river, and they come into uh, uh, our state. They come with lice, um, they, they come with um, scabies, these are all personal hygiene issues, they, they're not anything that is really that unusual, it's just that they all come with that and it can very easily be treated, and it is. Uh, the Border Patrol has set up some really very effective facilities for doing that. They've also developed some very pretty sophisticated ways of looking at them medically. They didn't have it at first when they got inundated with them, but subsequently they did set these things up. So they've been able to really kind of work primarily within the, the resources they have, but with the Department of State Health Services also being involved in this to make sure they don't have tuberculosis, uh, to be sure that they have the right testing, to be sure that they, they don't have that. Make sure they have their immunizations uh, when they come in, because that is probably one of the biggest public health hazards that we could have, is if they come with you know diseases that we know that we can prevent with, uh, with um, uh, vaccinations and so forth. Um, the idea that they're coming with some of these more sort of exotic diseases like leprosy, uh, we're, we're not seeing that. Um, there may be an occasional uh, case of that that you see, but that's not something that's really coming over in, in great numbers and stuff. Um, but there is going to be a, a, a fiscal impact to all of this to the state, even though it's, it's the federal government primarily that has to assume the, the cost of you know, getting these kids you know, into the right places, hopefully ultimately getting them back where, where they they came from, but that's not happening quickly, as we all know. Um, we have to be prepared that you know the state could uh, you know take on some of the burden of that, uh, both in terms of the education system, of which you know these you know, some of these kids may get plugged into the education system, depending on where they get distributed. Uh, there's obviously a cost for people that comes along with that that the state will bear and the local uh, school districts will bear. From a healthcare point of view, you know that nobody gets denied healthcare if they show up in a hospital emergency room. Um, no matter what their immigration status is. That's a cost that ultimately is going to be borne by um, the citizens that are in a particular community and perhaps ultimately by the state also. So, so there, are some real, uh, there are some real fiscal impacts going on with the border right now. And uh, um, I know we're, 
several of us here are involved in a, in a special committee that the speaker set up to study what these fiscal impacts are. So as we go into the next legislative session, start our budgeting process, uh, we do that with our eyes open and an understanding of what some of the impacts might be. That's a long conversation on something that I know is top of mind for, for lots of people, and there's others that can speak to this, uh, I think, um, very, very well. And so with that, I'll just close and say thank you, Drew, for having me, and I'll pass it on to uh, Chairman Otto. I'm John Otto. Uh, I represent House District 18, which is all of Liberty County, San Jacinto County, and Walker County. Uh, so I have 11 prisons in my district. Uh, I have Sam Houston State University in my district. Uh, I tell people if you're a golfer, I do a dog leg left around Harris and Montgomery County. Uh, that's my part of the state. I've, I also want to thank Drew. He, we were sitting out there a while ago as the last panel and he came up and thanked me for coming out. I said, Drew, I ought to be thanking you because it is so important that representatives get to visit as many parts of this state as we can. We know our home district. We know what resources we have, we know what the problems are, we know what our voters are concerned about. But, you know, the one thing that every legislator eventually understands is this is a very large, diverse state. And when you're doing policy, it sure helps if you've been to a few places in it to understand what the people in those areas, what's important to them. So this is really a benefit to those of us sitting up here that Drew uh, invited us out here to come. Uh, I've been, I just realized I'm the senior member up here, and I don't, <laughs> uh, I came first into the legislature in 2005, I'm finishing up my fifth term. I'm a certified public accountant by background, so for the last four sessions I have served on as vice chair of ways and means, and I've been on the appropriations, the budget committee. Uh, this past session I was the subcommittee chair over article three, which is education. So my subcommittee developed the House version of the budget for both public and higher education. Uh, Drew also asked me to talk a little bit about that in connection with the border. Uh, as John just said, Drew and John and I, as along with a few others out here, I think, are on this select committee to, to look at the fiscal cost of what's happening on our border. Not just the deployment of DPS and uh, the Guard, but think about this. How many of these children are going to end up in our school system this September or August when they enroll? Uh, Drew and I actually got, ended up taking a trip to the border together uh, a couple of weeks ago and got to see firsthand uh, on the tour down there what's going on. Folks, imagine this. Transportation and water, you're right. The things you've been hearing about today are going to be probably the two most important things to continue that the legislature has to address. Right behind that is going to be education, health care, what do we do in these areas. We have an unknown number of children that are going to be put in our school system. Why is it unknown? Because the federal government is not telling us where they are shipping these children, how many, where to. I have a concern for this reason. We fund public education in this state. For every one of these kids that go, let's say they're concentrated in one particular part of the state, that school district that's going to serve them is not going to get funded by the state for those extra head counts because it's a, based on an estimate uh, at the start of the school year. And if they don't know how many of these kids they're going to get, how do they estimate that? So when do they get the money from the state to cover those increased uh, children? a year from them after the school year is over all right it makes planning very very difficult another issue that concerns me and concerns a lot of educators what is this going to do to the accountability system that we have in place on measuring progress with students when we don't even know if all of these children speak spanish even i'm hearing there are some indian dialects that are mixed in so are you going to hold school districts to the same accountability standards and they're not even going to know how many of these children they're bringing into their district? Obviously, for all of these kinds of issues like this, guess what? There's a cost. And so we're trying, the select committee that the speaker appointed, we're trying to get our hands around uh, prior to session 
what is going to be the fiscal impact of everything that's going on the border, not just the DPS surge, not just the guard, but health care, education, all of the various factors that are going to play into this. Uh, the one thing I seem to be sure of is that Texas will end up probably with more than its fair share of these children. There was an article in the Dallas Morning News last week that all that uh, immigration has already released uh, right at 4,300 of these children in the state of Texas. Now that's all we know. They're here. Uh, they were released to a parent, a relative, or to a sponsoring agency or person. But after that, we have no idea where they are. Uh, so, I, and I don't know how many more are going to be released. While they're on a federal facility, if they're at Lackland Air Force Base, the state of Texas is not responsible for them. The federal government is. But the minute they are released, they then become our responsibility to educate and take care of. Uh, so there is a, in, you know, in a nutshell, one of the other issues that the legislature is going to have to look at and deal with in this upcoming session. And unfortunately, it's not one that we can easily predict. So I, as, as things progress. If, if I could jump in right yeah. in, John, for, John Frulo, for following up on that, one of the interesting figures that we've learned in recent testimony is the fact that it takes about $9,000 to educate one of these children. So the state of Texas, or TEA, has as resources, backup resources, <coughs> about uh, enough resources to pay for about 25,000 to 27,000 children still meet the need so uh, but it does cost these school districts money it would be reimbursed about a year from now so following up it's hard to interrupt go ahead well, thank you drew and uh, i just want to uh, i'm john frulo from uh, lubbock district uh, 84 as a <clears throat> excuse me as one guy said i have the inner city of lubbock and then uh, charles has the rest but um, <laughs> it's a uh, it's uh, kind of interesting. It, the one thing I did also notice is I'm part, part of a uh, four John panel up here. So this is a, <laughs> and, and, and three of us are actually, uh, I, I, I no longer take credit for being a CPA. I, I just do recreational accounting. But of course, uh, John Otto and uh, Charles Perry are both uh, CPAs. And uh, I think at one time our senior member up here was the only one in the house. Is that uh, uh, Carl Ice? Carl was there. Was, okay, there were two of us. You know, how do we forget about Carl so quickly? <laughs> <laughs> my predecessor, and if, if you don't get back to him with that, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. I think if you if you want to become a budget expert, of course, right here we've got, uh, well, three of the, the, the most important guys on the budget process, and of course, Charles is on appropriations too, but, you know, if you break it down into big numbers, we have a $200 billion budget. Uh, John Zerwas, Dr. Zerwas, has about $75 billion in uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, John Otto and, uh, uh, of course, higher ed, if you take public ed and higher ed, that's about 75 billion, or roughly in round numbers, you know, and we're, we're using billion, so we'll just round, but it's, that's 150 billion of the 200, 200 billion that we, as a state, spend in a biennium. So that's a, you know, that's a big chunk of it, 75%, and we do everything else with that other 25 billion, or other 50 billion, so uh, it's it just kind of interesting. Uh, I think the other thing, this is, uh, I finished up Carl's uh, term, and uh, so I'll actually be, uh, assuming I win my next, next election in November, going in for my fourth term, but I've been through two sessions. And so we've gone from a time where we had uh, a shortage of money to last session where I, th I think we, uh, through the hard work of these folks, came up with what was probably the best budget, the most realistic, one of the truest budgets we've ever had. We uh, started working on getting rid of diversions and putting money where we said it would go to where it's going, getting rid of all those little things. And, and I think truly coming up with what is a good uh, baseline budget. Uh, this next session, it looks like we're going to uh, have um, extra money. And of course, uh, uh, I think it's our job not to spend that money. If we don't need to spend your money, we don't. We uh, make sure it goes back to where it should be, and that's with you. And, and don't worry, I know a lot of you people aren't uh, voting or don't vote in my district, so it's not a spiel. It's just, a, I think, the basic uh, uh, belief of where we're at and, and what most of us believe. As uh, Drew said earlier, we're not doing this. Uh, uh, 
for uh, that $600 a month or anything like that. It's because we truly want to make Texas a better place. And I think uh, these folks have up here. Uh, but it, it's an interesting time. It'll be a challenging time to figure out where we're going. Uh, you know, transportation has been big. If you, you know, looking at taking that money out of the rainy day fund, we started uh, this uh, biennium with about uh, a little over six uh, billion in the rainy day fund. I think we added about two and a half billion uh, last November. The estimate is to add anywhere between two and a half to three billion this time. Took two billion out for the the water proposition that you passed. Looks like we're going to probably take at least uh, 1.2 billion out for transportation if you uh, again all you participate and choose to do that. And we're still going to have somewhere around eight and a half billion in our uh, rainy day, you know, our state bank account. So. There's a lot of good things happening in Texas. I think there's a, a lot of excitement. Uh, and we're doing all of that with a uh, bullseye on our back from Washington, as you heard earlier, and of course a bunch of great panels today. Uh, but we're, we're doing that with constant pressure, people trying to uh, make sure that we don't succeed. And uh, darn it, we're, we're succeeding anyhow. So I want to thank you for what you're doing on that part, too. And now the, the last John. <laughs> Uh, I'm John Rainey. I'm from District 14, which is the greatest district in the whole state of Texas. Includes Texas a &M. And I know you guys out here in this part of the country love that. Uh, matter of fact, there's another ag here, too, up here. Quit working here. <laughs> uh, I appreciate uh, Drew inviting me to be out here. I think every one of us on this panel are members of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, I was fortunate enough to serve with Drew on Articles 6, 7, and 8, and uh, I learned a lot, and uh, that was my first term. Uh, I hope that I get to serve on the committee again with Drew. He is a great leader. Uh, I was at a meeting not too long ago, and they told us, somebody mentioned that uh, 100 years ago, what do you think the three most important issues were in the state of Texas? And they were water, transportation, and education. <laughs> so nothing has changed in that hundred years. They're still the most important issues. Uh, I serve on appropriations and also on higher education. And uh, as I see it, one of the most important things that we have missed for quite a while is uh, vocational and technical education. Uh, we have Blinn College in our district, uh, or a branch of Blinn College in our district. And uh, I am hopeful that we see more of that taking place. I was told at one time that the uh, average age for a plumber in the state of Texas was 62 years old. But I think that was three years ago. So I guess that average is still climbing. Same thing for painters, uh, automobile mechanics. Uh, we need them. Uh, it's not an easy job. It's not a shade trade mechanic situation any longer. They've got to be pretty smart. I also understand that we have, uh, I think, 31% uh, or something like that of our budget goes to um, Medicaid. And if we're ever going to get out of that situation, we're going to have to have some trained people working. And that's why I believe in, uh, particularly in uh, vocational and technical training. Uh, we were told in one meeting that there was, uh, down at Victoria College, undoubtedly they have a very good welding program. and. Uh, it's a two-year program to get a certificate. Very few people pass that program or complete that program because after a year, they make $75,000 a year. <coughs> this is what we're missing. We need to be preparing folks to do jobs that they can participate in. If we don't prepare them, they're going to be out there spending our money with uh, Medicaid. And we have to change that uh, process. Plus, there's a lot of industries, and I suspect out here in in uh, this area, in the oil industry, you need a lot of trained people. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, vocational tech training will become a big part of, of Blinn. Uh, we also are growing with Blinn with the fantastic growth of Texas A&M and all the things that are happening there. Uh, as, as that goes on, I think we talked a little bit about transportation, but I would encourage you to vote for uh, the amendment that will be on the ballot uh, in November. It's very important. Transportation is a big portion of our economy. It will keep our economy growing. One of the things that somebody told me not too long ago was that 
when it, we'll do something about transportation when those people that live in Round Rock, it takes them two hours to get to downtown Austin. And uh, Austin is one of the areas that really needs some help with transportation. And uh, with my time there and uh, during the session, it's hard to get around there. Uh, I think our whole state needs it. Uh, their toll roads are costing us a lot of money individually, <coughs> and uh, we need to handle the congestion in those big cities. So I would encourage you to vote for that uh, Constitution amendment. I appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel. I'd be happy to answer any <coughs> questions y'all might have after it's all over with. We can stand around and talk and visit. Thank you. My name is Ben Shepard. Uh, I am not a member of the Texas House of Representatives. I <laughs> uh, spent a lot of time there. Uh, I'm happy, uh, Chairman Darby, uh, to be invited to sit at the grown-ups table today. Uh, I, I'm going to do. I'm going to start off um, for the, with with some slides here in just a minute. As soon as this thing gets warmed up, and I'm I'm sure it's one of those things where most of you can't even see them. Um, but uh, I, and I've just got a few, 25 or 30. So. Um, uh, but the Permian Basin Petroleum Association, uh, we're, we're oil and gas uh, trade association based in Midland, but we cover the whole Permian. And uh, as you all know, the oil and gas industry is doing pretty well right now. Uh, uh, well, I've never been able to get members of the legislature to move that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let me try that again. Uh, uh, Anyhow, you know, uh, think things are, are, are fantastic uh, in an unprecedented time in the oil and gas industry out here. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the economic impact uh, that we're seeing. Uh, obviously, uh, that's not, uh, as we've heard today, uh, without some challenges, and, and you're all aware of those. And, and we're part of what we do is try to address uh, the challenges associated with the, with the red hot industry like this. So I'll go ahead and kick this off real quick, if I can. Oh, well, maybe not. <laughs> we, we tried this earlier, really. We did. Uh, You're on computer. Too. There you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, for those of you, most of you who cannot see that uh, diagram, what this is is essentially the Permian Basin. Um, the uh, this is the eastern shelf uh, of the Midland platform and, and, and the Delaware Basin there. Uh, it's roughly 54 counties. Um, what you see here in the colored shade is the overlay of the size of the Eagleford, which we all know stretches from west of Houston to Laredo and beyond. Uh, and then the dark gray is the, uh, the Bakken Formation in North Dakota. Um, interesting thing, I challenge maybe a couple of Chairman Otto, I bet you can read uh, some of these numbers, but I'll just give you a couple of high points. What These are comparing the three, uh, the, the, the numbers up here, I'm, I'm just going to touch on a couple. One of the things that's exciting about the Permian is uh, the, uh, the thickness, or, or the layers of, of possible production, layers of oil and gas, uh, primarily oil, uh, that are down there. <coughs> Um, and what this slide shows is it's, and, and these numbers are changing all the time. We're increasingly these, uh, Tim Dove, you heard at lunch, and others are identifying additional resources, but the Permian's about 2,500 feet thick in, in producing hay areas, is what they say. Um, compare that to the Eagleford, it's 50 to 250. Um, Bakken, 25 to 125. So, uh, the Permian Basin potentially has a very, very long life, um, and there are multiple layers, like stacks of pancakes out there, and that's one of the things that makes people so bullish on the Permian and, and, and finding opportunities now, but uh, for potentially for decades to come. Uh, one of the most prolific fields uh, in, in, in the Permian is the sprayberry, the wolf camp. Um, this slide is the largest U.S. oil field, uh, and this slide uh, estimates that the Sprayberry Wolf Camp uh, has about 50 billion barrels of recoverable oil. The next largest is the Eagle Ford with about 26, 27 billion, uh, and, and then we go on from there. But it's fascinating to me and those, those of us who, who look at this stuff every day, just how large 
it truly is. Um, the Permian's the granddaddy of them all uh, as far as the oil fields. Um, uh, I'll get to this in just a second for, for um, well, I'll, I'll just keep going. One of the reasons you're seeing um, the, the increase in production and truck traffic and everything else around here and employment, um, um, tax revenue and all of those benefits that we see is because of technology and uh, I'll just briefly touch on some of the, some of the reasons that, that we think are contributing to that. Horizontal drilling uh, is one. Um, 3D seismic is another. Uh, pad drilling, in other words, drilling multiple wells from one pad location uh, is another. These are all factors that are increasing the, the uh, productivity. Um, and, and those really started kicking in at the beginning of the decade. Um, of course, price doesn't hurt. Um, we, we've enjoyed a, a 90 to a hundred dollar price for, for the last couple of years. Um, here's an example. Uh, in 2005, there are 129 rigs running in the Permian. Uh, right now, there are about 560. Um, that represents about a third of all the, the drilling rigs in the country. Um, uh, more than half the rigs in Texas are in the Permian. Um, we, we just completed a, an economic impact analysis of the Permian, uh, which, uh, as all of you know, includes Texas and New Mexico, and it was a little tricky comparing, you know, a lot of the publicly available data, you know, is, is collected and reported differently in the two states, but 36 jobs. That's direct and indirect as well. Um, economic output, $137 billion, and, and these are uh, 2012 numbers. I think um, we, we will see those increase when we do our 13 study um, and contribute $71 billion to the gross state product of both states, Texas and New Mexico. Um, in the Texas portion, 440,000 jobs, $113 billion in economic output and more than $60 billion to the gross state product. I, I'll defer to Chairman Otto and others about how much has uh, been contributed uh, oil and gas uh, uh, dollars have been contributed to the rainy day fund and, and in various ways it's benefited the state. Uh, I think we all see the benefits every day, not only jobs right here in San Angelo and throughout the region, but jobs in Dallas and in Houston and in Austin and, and wherever you may be. Um, that's about all of my uh, unreadable slides, but, but just let me make a, a couple of points. You know, the economic uh, Outlook is pretty rosy right now, but of course it's not without its challenges. Um, we've talked about some of our infrastructure challenges, and, and, and there's there's more uh, more where that came from. Um, fortunately, everybody's taking those issues very seriously, and, and, and really rolling up their sleeves, uh, trying to try to get to work. But we're also the industry is um, truly under attack in ways that it's never been before. Um, not not only from 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 Washington, but it, it, you know. Uh, from interest groups and, and some problems that are historic legacy problems that the industry has been slow to deal with, many others that are from advocacy groups that really just don't want any more carbon economy at all. So we're dealing with a whole range uh, of issues. It keeps us quite busy. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's always a game of compromise. Um, and these guys know this better than anybody. But, you know, the industry is evolving and changes. You heard about water recycling and the great strides uh, that, that, that are occurring there. Um, the industry is responding. Um, you know, and I think where folks are willing to dialogue with the industry, we're going to find common ground, period. Um, if, if, it, if there are those, and those groups do exist, that whose stated mission is to get the world off the carbon economy, we're probably not going to find a whole lot of common ground with those folks. But, but uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a dangerous time. Should we, uh, should groups federally or locally be able to ban the process of hydraulic fracturing? I think you would see the brakes slammed on this economic engine faster than you can turn the lights off. I mean, there's billions and possibly trillions of dollars of investment at stake. <coughs> And if you can't complete your wells and access your minerals, you're not going to drill them. You're not going to, you're going to lay those people off. You won't have as many trucks on the road, but you're not going to have the kind of economic impact I just described. Um, you know, 
I think uh, the industry is also enjoying working with uh, local communities. There's a number of efforts here around the state. Bryan College Station is one, Denton is another, Alpine, um, uh, other communities, even the city of the, the metropolis of Presidio uh, has, has, has gotten pressure and many others are having pressure put on them, put upon them to, to, to ban the process of fracking. I'm pretty sure there's not very many people who are really eyeballing drilling in Presidio right now, but it could happen. Um, point being, there's this groundswell of activism out there, um, and, and, and frankly, people, uh, it's one thing to come out here and see 560 rigs out in far west Texas, from, from here to Abilene to Lubbock to, to Odessa, and, and on to Carlsbad and Artesia. It's another thing when you're in an urban setting and we're, when we're, we're competing with the roads and school buses and things like that. Um, and, and, and so these are challenges we're, we're faced with right now that frankly I think they're, they're solutions and compromise out there. But um, you know, it, it's, it, it, there's the good with the bad. You know, I think in, in some cases we may be a bit of a victim of our success, um, but, but I think we're all willing to, to make sure that you know, we don't want to, the industry as a whole does not want to participate uh, in creating problems that then causes the local citizenry then to call these guys uh, and get them mad at us too, which gets out that you know, the whole world uh, uh, can be shrunk uh, in, in a heartbeat if we're not taking care of our business properly. And so that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. Um, and that, that's my quick, maybe not so quick overview of what, what we're up to. So thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you, Ben. Um, well, my colleagues get repositioned here. Uh, I know that each one of you are strong supporters of public education in Texas. And I guess kind of tying into what Ben said, uh, we all are familiar with the water and transportation issue. We talked about that today. But it has an impact on, on workforce. And I know we have some panels tomorrow to address this concern. But uh, as strong supporters of public education, I know every one of you voted for HB5. And, uh, and that has, has been transformative in nature with our public education and, and our endorsement programs. And, and, uh, and I'd just like to, uh, each one of you, if you want to touch a little bit about uh, how you're seeing your area impacted by uh, uh, you know, this resurgence in the economy. You, you may not have direct oil and gas jobs in your district, but you have uh, you're having to pay more uh, for your service-related industries because of losing jobs to the oil field. I know uh, we've, we've had uh, certainly uh, challenges in the prisons, for John, uh, uh, keeping uh, workforce there in the prisons uh, and, and keeping them properly staffed. Uh, if you would uh, comment a little bit about uh, public education, HB5, and what you're seeing, how it's addressing the uh, workforce needs of this state. Okay. You're exactly right. First, let me talk about the correctional officers. Imagine what the differential in pay is for a correctional officer versus going to work in the oil field. It is, it is significant. So we, uh, we were able to increase that some last time, but we, there's still a delta there that is making it very difficult to staff prisons, especially those that are located in the areas where all this oil and gas activity is going on. I would say that on, regarding House Bill 5, uh, you know, one of the, in my, in my opinion, one of the biggest mistakes we made as a state was getting rid of vocational education. We should have been ramping it up uh, because not, in, not every kid is going to go to a four-year university and become an engineer but they still need to be able to feel like they can get a productive job. Uh, I will go down saying that what uh, Chairman Acock passed last session with House Bill 5, I think in the long run we're going to look back and it's going to be the thing I'm going to be most proud of, having served in the Texas House, because it's going to put us back on a path of helping a young child, a young man or young woman, for whatever reason that is not able or can't pursue a four-year college degree can still get a good paying job. Let me just make it to a local level. Before House Bill 5 passed, my high school started something called the Dayton Workforce Academy. It was a night school. And what they did was they brought in both high school students and adults 
that were looking to change and they taught welding, CAD drafting, auto mechanics. We had people, the reason they started this school was because the Port of Beaumont had to import 300 welders from India in order to get qualified welders. There's something wrong when our education system, and by the way, when these kids got certified, their starting salary was around 75000 a year. And some of them went on and became inspectors, making even more. I think that House Bill 5 is going to be the key that unlocks opportunity for a lot of children that were dropping out because they couldn't keep up with the 4x4 four four program of trying to be forced into this uh, square peg into a round hole of, of preparing for a four-year university. Now, we cannot back off the accountability, and for those children that do want that, you still got to have that stringent coursework. But we basically were forgetting about these other kids. And I think, uh, maybe it'll take a while, it'll take six, eight years down the road to see the fruits, true fruits of all of this, but uh, now if we can just find a way to keep them drug-free so they can take the job, uh, we will have conquered a, a, a big issue in this state. Well, I, I concur. I think it'll go down as transformational looking back. I think education got made relevant again for the classroom and the student and the teacher teaching it. Kind of locally what I'm seeing in a, in a kind of a, I think it's almost a byproduct. I think we thought it would occur, but it's hurt, occurring on a, on, a, on a local level. It has made partnerships that didn't exist with some of the local school districts in the area, come together, talk about what their resources are, what some of the HB, HB5 requirements, the endorsements that we've allowed them to go after. You know, not every school may have a shop, but some schools may have different components. And just as importantly, I think it rejuvenated and gave the community colleges a new life. They were already kind of plugged into some of this, but now that we've provided this, this venue of different endorsements, and it may be specialty trades, it may be uh, CNA supports for the medical side, it may be nursing schools, those have become more relevant overnight. And so I've seen our community colleges come into the public school system and make those endorsements relevant to where the kids can get out with a two-year endorsement degree or an associate. So we have filled a void that existed for years. I say that no child left behind was kind of every child got left behind at some level. And I think that this has kind of revamped our education system to what it was needed to be, is prepare kids to go to work and be productive citizens. But in my area, it's also banded some communities together where we are currently looking at how do you meet the needs of some of the career techniques that the schools may not have the resources to do on their own, but in a community setting, it makes more sense because we already got some community night schools going. So the partnerships that's gonna come out of that is gonna produce benefits that we didn't probably even expect or anticipate. HB5 was probably, as I think Chairman Otto said, we'll look back and it will be the best piece of legislation the state's done in many, many years. And I'm really proud to be a part of it. But uh, it's these partnerships and coalition and these coming together throughout the district that I serve that are, you know, we've got people driving in from different cities now to participate in some of these programs. So it's really exciting to see it evolve. We've got a little time and it'll, it'll, it'll mature to where we thought it would. Um, I'll, I'll speak to just in, in the district I represent. I didn't uh, mention what it is. It's actually the Katy area, which is uh, kind of in far west Houston area, and is uh, one of, District 28 is actually one of the most uh, one of the fastest growing districts in the state. Fort Bend County is one of the fastest growing counties in the state and the nation, uh, and we are seeing the, the the effect of the energy industry, fr frankly, being uh, Houston being the the, the world headquarters for energy. Uh, people are migrating to the west and they're finding schools that they want their children to go to and that's one of the things that Fort Bend uh, in general with the school districts that it has has been very well known for providing very high quality education. HP5 is what everybody asked for and um, there is no doubt that uh, administrators, superintendents, teachers, everybody's come together and said this is great it's kind of like the dog chasing the car. Okay, we got it. Now, how do we make it work? And that's actually part of the exercise I was in this morning, which is why I wasn't here earlier. Was uh, we were sitting down as a as a Fort Bend County sort of uh, group of people, about about 50 of us uh, from different areas. Students participated in some of the discussions. Says, okay, how do we make this work? We've got all these options now, and what are the things that are going to be most successful? And 
to some extent, how are we going to end up paying for some of these things and stuff? So, you know, do you focus on the STEM education series because that continues to be a very important area? But are there other aspects of education that are equally important? Uh, you know, just in incorporating the right work ethic in people. Are we giving the kids enough of that as they're growing up so that they can be successful? Very strong opinions around the table about that, and then some other things that we we talked about. And so. So it, it does open up huge opportunities, I think, for um, education. It's going to take some real serious uh, thinking, collaboration, as mentioned, uh, at the local levels to come up with what best meets the needs of your particular population that you're dealing with. And again, I think that's one of the, the great things about this is it allows us to look at the various school districts, the various localities, that determine what is the needs of the people that are coming out of your particular school districts and how can we best meet those needs out there. So it's an exciting time. Uh, HB5 and, and Chairman Acock's leadership on this was, uh, was terrific. Uh, very, very much uh, you know, proud to get to be a part of that. And I think it, it is going to do some great things, but it's, to some extent it's also the work has just begun now that this door has been opened. I might point out it was a unanimous vote in the House. That doesn't happen very often, folks. Uh, Ben, do you, uh, again, you have your pulse upon the oil and gas economy. Uh, from an employment workforce standpoint, are you, or the industries that you represent, uh, are they, do they have access to a uh, trained, uh, willing workforce there? Or, I mean, I, I hear figures of we're in full employment right now, uh, uh, as full as we can ever get. Uh, so tell me, tell me about the challenges of uh, the workforce. And as you know, Mr. Chairman, and, and some some may not uh, be as familiar, but uh, most all of the communities in in the Permian and uh, the epicenter being Midland and Odessa. Midland and Odessa has had unemployment under three percent for forty years now. Uh, it's low throughout the region. Um, so the problem we have is finding qualified workers uh, from top to bottom. Um, you know, as the example you gave on the welder, it's a, a similar one with the, the truck driver. Um, you know, truck drivers can, can walk out there and start making 80 grand driving the truck and, and, and go on up. Um, it's hard to, to uh, the need is so great, it's hard to get uh, maybe sometimes the hunt for the dollar is so, so, so needful that the training uh, giving sometimes gets accelerated and, and uh, uh, like, you know, would like to have some more avenues for that, I think. I see, you, you see the community, you know, the community colleges as well as the universities talk about um, the need for <coughs> petroleum engineers, uh, geologists, uh, uh, whether they be based in the Permian or not. I mean, the UT, UT's cranking out petroleum engineers again after a while, they, they, they weren't for a while. Um, it, it's a real need, uh, but the flip side of that um, um, is housing. Um, you know, with the, the desperate need for people, you can't build houses quickly enough, and the, uh, if they're just coming into the workforce, um, and it, you know, they certainly can't if they're if they're if they're at, at the lower end of the economic spectrum. It, it, it's a it's a real real challenge. Uh, 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 one that I think we're, we're seeing some of those numbers edge down in terms of cost, but. Um, we, we have real needs there, and, and, and I'm hopeful that this emphasis from HB5 will help throughout the state, including out here. 